On May 16, 2011, the New York Times published an op-ed titled The Long Overdue Palestinian State by Mahmoud Abbas, president of the Palestinian National Authority. In that piece, Abbas called for the United Nations to formally recognize a Palestinian state based on the pre-1967 borders, regardless of negotiations with the state of Israel. The article appeared just a few days before Barack Obama's much-anticipated speech on the Arab Spring, in which the president also tried to jumpstart peace negotiations between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. To reach an agreement on a two-state solution, Obama declared, Israel must agree to return to the pre-1967 borders modified only by mutually agreed land swaps. Now, neither Mr. Abbas nor Mr. Obama can explain how anyone could have recognized a United Nations designated Palestinian state that Palestinian leaders and the Arab states themselves have rejected. Of the troubles in Ireland, the poet William Butler Yeats once wrote, Great hatred, little room, maimed us at the start. In Palestine at the start, there was plenty of room, more than enough room, for a prosperous Jewish state and a prosperous Arab state. After World War I ended with the dismantling of the Ottoman Empire, the League of Nations established the Mandate for Palestine, including all of the land that is now Israel, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip, plus the entire territory east of the Jordan River, now called the Kingdom of Jordan. The area under the mandate was as large as Syria and about half as large as Iraq. Yet the total population at the time was less than one million, of whom 10% were Jews. It was in that vast, underdeveloped and underpopulated territory that the British had promised in the language of the 1917 Balfour Declaration to support the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. The Declaration also promised that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Open Jewish immigration to the Holy Land was encouraged, as was freedom of speech, religion, and assembly for the Arabs of Palestine, rights they had sorely lacked under Turkish rule. Mired for more than two centuries in backwardness and grinding poverty, Palestinians were never recognized by the Ottoman Empire as possessing any distinctive national identity. The Palestinians quickly took advantage of their new freedom to speak bluntly, demanding a stop to the Jewish immigration which had just begun. Said one Arab representative during the Paris Peace Conference, we will push the Zionists into the sea, or they will send us back into the desert. Arif Pasha Dajani, a Palestinian leader from Jerusalem, warned that it is impossible to live with the Jews. In all the countries where they are at present, they are not wanted because they always arrive to suck the blood of everybody. If the League of Nations will not listen to the appeal of the Arabs, this country will become a river of blood. Well, as promised, blood did flow when the Palestinian demand to end Jewish immigration was not granted. Jerusalem was the first flashpoint for regular Arab attacks on Jewish communities in April 1920. Palestinians from nearby towns poured into the old city. The Muslim mayor of Jerusalem and other notables worked up the crowd to launch a jihad against the Jews. If we don't use force against the Zionists and against the Jews, we will never be rid of them, urged newspaper editor Arif Al-Arif. The crowd shouted back, we will drink the blood of the Jews shouting Islamic slogans like Mohammed's religion was born with the sword. Thousands surged through the Jewish quarter and into West Jerusalem. The mobs vented their rage against any Jew they could find, burning and looting homes and stores and even attacking British and Arab policemen. After several days of rioting, the final toll was six Jews dead, hundreds beaten and widespread destruction of property. What became known as the Nebi Musa riot was the opening shot in a 90-year war to reverse the Balfour Declaration. And things soon got worse as the Allies, to assuage the fears of Arab monarchs, separated the land east of the Jordan River out of the total area accessible to Jewish immigrants and created the Emirate of Transjordan. Reconciling the aspirations of Arabs and Jews became far more tenuous after the Balfour Declaration had to be carried out in the truncated area of Palestine from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. There was now much less room and a great deal more hatred. The decades that followed were marred by perpetual violence against the Jews both in Palestine and in Europe. 
the two were often linked. Under the leadership of the Grand Mufti and President of the Supreme Muslim Council, Haj Amin al-Husseini, the Arabs of Palestine waged an endless jihad against their Jewish neighbors. When the British sent a royal commission to investigate a solution, the Jews, represented by Chaim Weizmann, pressed for a partition of the territory into two states, even if the territory assigned to the Jews was the size of a tablecloth. The Peel Commission's final report, published in July 1937, proposed such a division. The Jews were offered an independent state in a small enclave along the seacoast from Tel Aviv to the north of the country, constituting about 20% of the remaining mandate territory, while the Palestinian Arabs would get 80% for their own state. Desperate for any means to be able to bring in large numbers of the endangered European Jews, the Zionists reluctantly accepted the Commission's partition plan. Led by the Mufti, the Arabs rejected partition out of hand and pressed on with the armed revolt against the mandate. The British succeeded in putting down the violence for a time. Al-Husseini was sent into exile, ultimately, in Hitler's Nazi Germany, where he lived as a special guest of the Fuhrer. But severe limitations were placed on Jewish immigration to the Holy Land in the years leading up to the Holocaust that undoubtedly directly led to the death of many thousands of European Jews. Now, following the atrocities of the Second World War, Britain relinquished authority over the mandate to the newly formed United Nations. The UN created yet another commission to try to figure out what to do with the contested territory. The United Nations Special Committee on Palestine recommended, by a vote of seven to three, yet another two-state solution, another partition plan to the General Assembly. This plan would have seen the territory divided almost equally between Jews and Arabs. Once again, the Zionists made public their acceptance of the proposal, and once again, Arab officials announced that any partition would be met with rivers of blood. Shortly after the UN vote, the 20-member Arab League sent their newly organized Arab Liberation Army against the Jews of Palestine. Elements of five regular Arab armies from Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon invaded Israel on May 15, 1948. Arab League Secretary General Abdul Rahman Azam vowed this will be a war of extermination and a momentous massacre which will be spoken of like the Mongol massacres and the Crusades. But despite their overwhelming numbers and heated rhetoric, after a year of fighting it was the Jewish state that had won a decisive victory. Based on the 1949 armistice lines, Israel's territory expanded by almost 40 percent. The Palestinian Arabs were the big losers. For the second time in 10 years, their leaders rejected a partition plan that would have given them independence and more land designated for their state than for the Jewish state. Instead, they ended up with nothing, and 650,000 Palestinians became refugees. Jordan's King Abdullah sent his Arab Legion to occupy the Palestinian West Bank and annex the territory to his kingdom. Egypt took the Gaza Strip and for the next 18 years denied Palestinians any civil rights. It never occurred to the rulers of Jordan or Egypt to create a state for the homeless Palestinians, nor did new Palestinian leaders like Yasser Arafat protest this occupation of their land by foreign rulers. Now, three times in the past decade, Israeli prime ministers have offered Palestinian leaders an independent state far more generous than anything Jordan and Egypt ever allowed when they controlled the West Bank and Gaza. At Camp David in 2000, Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak agreed to the border suggested by President Clinton that would have established a West Bank, Gaza, Palestinian state with some territorial adjustments and with the Palestinians getting East Jerusalem as their capital. For his part, Palestinian Liberation Organization Chairman Yasser Arafat walked out of negotiations, went back home, and launched the Second Intifada. Invoking Islamic Jew hatred as justification, the Palestinians conducted a three-year brutal campaign of suicide bombings against Israeli pizza parlors, wedding halls, and discotheques. In 2005, Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon decided that it was against Israel's security interest to govern the 1.1 million Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Sharon dismantled all of the Jewish settlements and pulled Israeli forces back across the 1967 borders between Israel and Gaza, without even any land swaps. As an added bonus, Israel left the Palestinians a thriving flour export industry to help jumpstart the local economy. 
the Palestinians' response to this generosity? Well, first they destroyed the donated greenhouses, and then they launched a war of missiles and rockets against civilian targets in Israel. In a September 2008 meeting in Jerusalem, then-Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert presented President Abbas with a detailed map of a future Palestinian state that, with land swaps, would constitute close to 100 percent of the territory of the West Bank and Gaza prior to the June 1967 war. Almert also offered to divide Jerusalem, enabling the Palestinians to locate their capital in the eastern half of the city. Promising to come back the next day for further discussions, Abbas took Olmert's map to his Ramallah office, just a few miles outside Jerusalem, for his aides to study. But Abbas never returned with the map. This was the last time the Israeli and Palestinian leaders met. Many times over the last 63 years, both the international community and the state of Israel have offered the Arabs of Palestine their own state. Each time, these offers have been met by more violence against Jewish citizens. Neither President Abbas nor President Obama are ignorant of this fact. They simply both choose to ignore it. For Mr. Abbas, this refusal seems to be part of a consistent thread woven throughout the Arab war against the Jews. Mr. Obama's positions remain more mysterious.